In terms of uh, environmental application, I started uh, with uh, industrial wastewater, municipal wastewater, and water pollution. And we continued with soil decontamination and also air pollution control and measurement. Uh, in terms of uh, properties that we worked with, we started with ion exchange. I'm going to discuss part of it, continue with adsorption and also catalytic application of this uh, magic materials. So today, uh, title of my presentation is environmental application of uh, porous materials from zeolites to metal organic frameworks. In this uh, talk, uh, short talk, I'm, I'm going to discuss about uh, porous materials, a little bit about, about history of zeolites uh, and MOFs, uh, some background uh, short uh, introduction about chemistry and properties of these materials and uh, the main part is environmental application. I'm going to uh, just share very briefly some of the works that we have done in all aspects of uh, uh, environmental application from ion exchange to adsorption to catalytic application of this uh, porous nanomaterials. Uh, zeolites, which are aluminosilicates, first, uh, I mean, discovered in 1756 and uh, almost six decades or seven decades later, so uh, scientists or, uh, let's say, geologists found lots of deposits around the world and uh, that's why they opened a new, really, industrial, ch new chapter in industrial minerals. Uh, so far, more than 60 natural zeolites and some of the, you know, uh, literature says more than 80 different natural zeolites uh, were, uh, I mean, uh, known so far and uh, found in different uh, deposits around the world. But among them, seven to eight, in some cases, uh, for, you know, some minus up to nine, uh, natural zeolites found lots of application. And my main focus or is on clean up light, which is from Hewlandite group, because it's the most abundant natural zeolites on earth and you, we can find it on all continents uh, around the world. Uh, so because of the specific properties and very uh, unique properties of these porous materials, uh, they found a numerous application, we call it from A to Z. Z. That's why uh, in Cuba that they, uh, they are very advanced in natural zoolites. Uh, newspaper to call it La Roca Magica or the magic rock or magic mineral. So uh, because they really can apply for, as you will see later on, for many different applications. Because they were really amazing in terms of, uh, you know, uh, different application from adsorption, ion exchange, uh, hydration, the de dehydration, so, uh, and the problem that we are having with natural deposit, which is the purity, we cannot find pure natural zoolites because of the way that, the fact that they formed in millions of years uh, in the nature. So scientists decided to mimic that natural structure and made synthetic one. So the first, uh, I mean, uh, try was in 1862, almost 100 years later, and uh, Eventually, almost 200 years later, in 1950, for the first time, union carbide uh, synthesized, uh, I mean, first natural zoolites and is one of the pioneers in this uh, area. And so far, more than, more than 150 different synthetic zoolites, uh, in which some of them are just mimicking of natural zoolites, some of them are totally new structure, were uh, designed and synthesized. And these days, as you see later on, uh, it's just the market share of synthetic zeolites is huge. It's not comparable with natural zeolites. So as you can see from the structure, uh, zeolites are aluminosilicates. Aluminum and silicon are the, uh, I mean, uh, structure, uh, structural parts and uh, alkaline and alkaline airs are uh, mobile cations that we can, uh, to balance the, the charge and also we can use this amazing ion exchange um, uh, properties to modify zeolites and tailor the structure and properties for different applications. Uh, 
zeolites as uh, because of the structure alum silicate structure the pore size of zeolites are very limited so it is well defined but we cannot go more than let's say 10 uh, 10 angstrom in some cases uh, because of that and we noticed in most of the application the pore size is very important because of size selectivity when it comes to adsorption, desorption, ion exchange, and also with many of catalytic application. Uh, uh, then in a, they, uh, scientists uh, eventually in 1990, almost you know, 30 years ago, uh, they came up with the uh, idea of mimicking uh, zeolite structure and uh, design the, what we call it uh, zeolitic like uh, structure and uh, in this specific case metal organic frameworks they replace silicon aluminum with uh, different metal and metal cl clusters like zinc copper cadmium all sorts of uh, I mean transition metals and they change that oxygen bonding with uh, metal linkers in this case so we can really play with the, the I mean, distance between at two atoms and also uh, engineer those pores from uh, angstrom size like zeolites to nano size, uh, even, you know, that's why we have uh, mesopore MOFs and micropore MOF as well, which, you know, opened a huge, uh, you know, chapter in the porous materials uh, chemistry. So in terms of market, as you can see, while natural zeolites have been around for many years, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, let's say volume size, volume-wise, natural zeolites are, you know, 2.7, for example, a uh, million ton in 2014, and synthetic was one just 1.7, 1 million ton less. When it comes to market value, as you can see, uh, synthetic zeolites are almost six times you know more expensive or uh, more valuable compared to natural zeolites and uh, in terms of uh, you know the market size uh, synthetic zeolites are close to 40 percent of the market uh, volume size and natural 60 but when it comes to value synthetic zeolites are more valuable because uh, they are pure and the application that we can uh, get out of them specifically in catalytic uh, uh, I mean, application and absorption for oil and petrochemical industry is huge. Uh, and as you can see, they have market all around the world, but uh, China, Western Europe, and North America uh, have two thirds of the share of this uh, market worldwide. In terms of uh, scientific publication, I just, uh, uh, I mean, I have some uh, slide for uh, natural zeolites because I love natural zeolites. As you can see, just growing uh, exp exponentially and uh, in terms of uh, different natural zoo, as I mentioned, kilinoptilolite is number one. And in more than 80% of the case, when someone talks about natural zoolites without naming, usually they're talking about uh, natural kilinoptilolite because we can find them in almost most of the countries uh, around the world. That, that is why it's interesting to see how, uh, I mean, uh, trend of our, let's say, publication and research is changing from natural zoolite to synthetic zoolites and MOF. While MOF started, you know, I'm talking about just 2010 to 2018. So in this period, uh, while natural zoolite and synthetic zoolites, I mean, number just got more or less, you know, a plateau because we exhausted most of the research aspect of it. In MOF, it's just growing so fast, and these days it's just uh, it's not comparable with uh, zeolites in terms of number of publication because of too many uh, I mean uh, uh, applications that you know we can get out of MOF uh, and engineer different uh, structures. In terms of uh, chemistry and properties, natural zeolites are very simple. So we have a mine, usually we mine it, we crush it, and then what we can see under the microscope, as you can see, depends on zeolites. In this case, it's uh, in uh, natural kinoptilolite, and in, uh, um, I mean, microscopy scale, and uh, you see what we can see, uh, like a honeycomb uh, type of a structure under, uh, in atomic scale. So the, those pores are contains those mobile cations that we can ch change them and tune and tailor different application uh, for different zeolites. Uh, synthetic zeolites more or less the same. We uh, while in uh, nature uh, natural zeolites uh, shaped you know millions of years in synthetic zeolites we can really synthesize zeolites. 
in a couple of minutes these days, as you can see later on with, you know, different uh, new uh, approaches like microwave-assisted or ultrasonic-assisted synthesis. Uh, but uh, overall, they all start from a silicon and aluminum source, and we sh they shape a second, what we call a secondary building unit, and those secondary building units connect to each other, make the, we call it sodalite uh, or beta cages, and those cages can uh, connect to each other in different way and make different zoolites. For that reason, synthetic zoolites, zoolites we call it somehow metastable phase because they can really uh, change form by time, by temperature. We can start with specific or uh, um, uh, same starting, uh, you know, batch composition. And by changing temperature, changing time, uh, changing ratio, we can really end up with different zoolites. As you can see, this three zoolites, LTA, phosphocyte, and sodalite are one of the, are among the most, um, I mean, popular synthetic zoolites. Phosphocyte, in this case, is uh, uh, the one that we use it. I mean, zoolite Y, for example, uh, for uh, FC, uh, FCC uh, uh, in, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, refineries for production of jet fuel and all sorts of uh, different uh, components. And LTA is one of the uh, main detergent builder this year, these days. All of the powder, uh, I mean, detergent, they have some, some, sometimes up to, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20% of uh, LTA in a, in a stuff, uh, STTP. Uh, in MOF, is the same, but instead of uh, silicon aluminum, we have a metal center. Instead of oxygen, in this case, we have an uh, organic linker and solvent, and we can go, in this case, microwave, ultrasound, or any type of energy, uh, make the, uh, I mean, secondary building unit, and then make those cages, and those cages are going to connect and uh, make an infinite type of uh, porous materials that can, you know, have different uh, pore size and different... Um, uh, structure depends to the type of linkers that you can use and also type of metal centers. It's the same, I, I just, you know, in this uh, slide uh, shows we can really start with the same, uh, uh, same uh, I mean, materials, same metal cluster, and by changing the linkers, we can end up with different uh, uh, MOF, in this case, ML100, ML101. When it comes to uh, properties, and that's why we, we love these materials and they have tons of applications because they have very specific unique properties, uh, ion exchange, which is the basic for zeolites because we can really tune and change all of the application uh, properties. They have absorption, desorption because they are porous materials and they can uh, act as a catalyst, uh, as uh, we will see later on. And for natural and synthetic zeolites, they can use as uh, because they are hydrated aluminum silicates, we can use as dehydration and uh, rehydration properties for as a desiccant, for example, or application uh, for gas purification. Uh, ion exchange is, uh, as I said, uh, I really call it uh, the main uh, properties of, synth of zeolite, synthetic and natural. As you can see here, by changing potassium with sodium zeolite 4A, which is one of the most popular, uh, I mean, uh, natural synthetic zeolites, we can change it to zeolite 3A and uh, change the pore size from four angstrom to three angstrom and then uh, tailor it for a specific application uh, when it comes to gas separation and purification. Now we get, get to the uh, environmental application. Uh, why my, my team uh, has been working on different aspects of, uh, I mean, natural zoolites, synthetic zoolites for um, uh, water purification and soil remediation. Uh, heavy metal removal. These days, one of the main challenges that we are facing, or uh, I mean, most of the countries, especially in North America, we are facing is lake eutrophication because we, uh, because of over fertilizing and the way that we uh, do our, um, I mean, agriculture these days uh, and uh, poor soil management. So we ended up sending, uh, washing out lots of nutrients, specifically phosphorus into, into the, uh, I mean, uh, surface water and to uh, fresh water these days. And most of the lakes in North America these days dealing with uh, what we call it, uh, 
uh, alcohol, alcohol bloom or uh, green uh, blue algae is growing, as you can see in this photo, and uh, they cause uh, lack of oxygen, oxygen inside the water, and uh, they kill lots of, um, I mean, um, uh, fish and uh, just kill the entire ecosystem. Uh, and uh, the, the water can be toxic because later it's going to uh, produce some toxic elements that I'm going to talk about that one as well. So in my team, we decided to develop a, a holistic approach to from uh, from um, I mean to tackle the uh, nutrient problem from the source in terms of uh, soil uh, fertilizer and also when uh, phosphorus ended up into water, we tried to develop some sort of uh, remediation process or remove that nutrients. So we started with zeolites. Zeolite is a cation exchanger. It can absorb cations very well, but it's not the best for anions. That's why we modified zeolites in different ways. In this case, for example, we modified with magnesium and ammonium. Uh, then magnesium, ammonium, when they come to contact with phosphor phosphorus, they can shape um, uh, a solid, uh, uh, I mean, fertilizer more or less but it's solid with very low solubility. Uh, we call it a struvite, and they can, uh, I mean, trap those phosphate. The other way that we did recently, as we can see, uh, in this case, zirconium modified. Uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, circulars, circulars are uh, natural zeolites, and those triangles are um, uh, magnesium ammonium modified, which, you know, uh, reacted a little bit better, but when we modified with zirconium, modified uh, zirconium, zeol, uh, zirconium, then the, the, I mean, the performance was just, just unbelievably good. And this is something that we are uh, in the uh, stage of patenting the process with the company here. They want to use the zirconium modified zeolites for uh, uh, to treating some of the lake, uh, fresh lake water in uh, Ontario and other part of the country. Uh, as I said, zeolites are uh, cation exchanger, but in these days, uh, most of the uh, you know uh, water and wastewater, we are dealing with lots of other uh, uh, molecules and pollutants like you know anions like chromate, arsenate, and uh, these days, lots of organic pollutants like VOC, volatile organic compounds. So uh, one thing that we did, uh, and we published a couple of papers, you know, almost uh, 10 years ago, uh, we modified zeolites with some surfactant, you know, eco-friendly surfactant. And uh, in this case, we developed a multifunctional adsorbent that can, the zeolite itself can see it react as a cation adsorb uh, adsorber. And uh, the modified surface can uh, act as a, uh, you know, uh, absorb, uh, absorbent for anions, as you can see for chromate in this case, and the bulk of this organic can uh, be used for um, um, organic molecule in this case removal for VOCs. Uh, we uh, designed some sort of, um, I mean, uh, we call it uh, engineering barrier, as you can see, for uh, to, rem uh, to remediate contaminated water with a uh, surfactant modified uh, zeolite barrier that can really remove uh, VOCs, anions, and cations at the same time. Uh, we use that uh, surfactant modified zeolites to remove cyanide from water, which is a very toxic, uh, uh, I mean, a species, as you know. And we, as you can see in this table, we compared our uh, adsorbent uh, zeolite A modified with uh, surfactant compared to other uh, published uh, results, as you can see, it, uh, the results of the modified is comparable with, uh, is, is, is really high compared to some other uh, adsorbent that reported out there. Uh, we use this, uh, I, mean, I mean, zeolites modified and unmodified for soil remediation. Uh, when we, uh, for example, in some places, they, they uh, irrigate uh, the soil with uh, wastewater, sometimes treated wastewater that they're really not uh, treated in terms of nutrient uh, part and also ammonium. So when we, we use zeolites in two different, uh, I mean, uh, fashion mixed with soil and also as a layer, as a barrier, as you can see here. Uh, so we noticed uh, if uh, we modify soil with 4% of zeolites, this kalinoptilolite, uh, 
uh, it can effectively redu reduce uh, uh, BOD and nitrate in wastewater drainage. So, uh, of course, natural zoolites are not the best for nitrate, but as we know, the, I mean, uh, the nitrogen cycle, we start with ammonium and then bacteria converge to nitrate and nitrite. So, in this case, when we see less nitrate in wastewater, it means at some point, zoolites cut this chain and because of the uh, good absorption capacity and uh, toward ammonium. Uh, we recently started working on campus. because campus is a big thing when it comes to solid waste management, organic solid waste management, and campus sometimes, as you can see, in these specific things. Uh, in some countries, developing countries, uh, uh, in Asia, in, in Africa, so we don't have the segregation like we have in some advanced countries. So in this case, when they are doing the campus thing, they have lots of contamination of the other, you know, contaminant waste. So uh, one of our PhD students uh, modified the uh, this campus with uh, different, um, I mean, zeolite, uh, uh, I mean, regime, and uh, we were able to fix some of those ammonium and phosphate at the same time, uh, reduce the mob mobility of some of those heavy metals that contaminate uh, campus and ended up in, uh, in water and, of course, in uh, plants later on. As uh, you can see, uh, modification really uh, reduced, uh, I mean, uh, the amount of uh, copper, lead, zinc, and nickel, and cadmium in the final uh, mature compost. And uh, also, uh, uh, you know, in the final corn that we, we grow, we notice the amount of um, uh, those heavy metals in final uh, plants is, is reduced dramatically. When it comes to... Uh, Synthetic zeolites, as I said, as soon as we have a silicon aluminum so, uh, source, we can really synthesize from any sources. And coal fly ash is one of them because coal fly ash from, uh, uh, from uh, coal, uh, I mean, power, uh, for, um, uh, power, uh, power plants uh, is one of the main ways uh, that, you know, most of the industry don't know what to do with it. So it's a huge source of aluminum and silicon. And we, we decided to convert that uh, cold fly ash to zeolites, to zeolitize those cold, cold fly ash. And in order to speed up the process, we decided to switch to microwave assisted synthesis. As you can see, we started in lab scale and then batch, batch wise, then we developed these things as a, I mean, continuous uh, microwave. And then we scale it up to pilot the scale of 100 kilograms per day. And uh, when I was at the University of Western Ontario, and when the, we, mod we used some of those zeolitized uh, cold fly ash for environmental application, and we published a paper on using uh, this uh, zeolites for mercury removal. And the results you see we could uh, remove up to 94% of mercury at the initial concentration of 10 milligram per uh, liter, which is a high concentration. Uh, in terms of, as I said, we are talking about waste and most of the time when it comes to sourcing of our silicon aluminum and uh, I mean, how we can really uh, ma manage those wastes. In one of the work that we did, uh, we used uh, a, a, an industrial waste from uh, a uh, plasma electrolytic oxidation process that was aluminum oxidation process, uh, which has uh, sodium hydroxide, a little bit of al aluminum, we used it and we mixed it with uh, some specific uh, ratio of cold fly ash and we converted that to waste cold fly ash and the wastewater from PEO to a value added product, in this case, a synthetic zeolite A. And uh, that's a paper that we published in 2014. Uh, in terms of application of this zoolitized coal fly ash, we the next step we modify this coal fly ash, uh, I mean zoolitized coal fly ash with some surfactant. And some of the surfactant are not uh, eco friendly, some of them are. We chose a couple of uh, eco friendly environmental friendly surfactant. And uh, this is a paper that we published recently in 2020. And we notice with uh, different uh, modif modification with different surfactant, we can increase the uh, chromate uh, adsorption capacity in a very meaningful way. Uh, when it comes to uh, 
catalytic application again uh, related to wastewater uh, wastewater treatment plant they have a sludge that has lots of uh, organic that they can really uh, be converted to what we call it waste to fuel waste to energy we can convert it to fuel so in this case we use the mesoporous spa 15 and modify it with cesium uh, and uh, use it as a catalyst for uh, converting uh, wastewater treatment sl uh, plant sludge to biofuel, and as you can see in the optimum condition that we, we did and published in 2013, we uh, uh, approached to 25%. It was not the highest, but when we, uh, I mean, the modified adsorbent and non-modified adsorbent uh, catalyst showed huge difference. And this, this uh, project is, uh, uh, you know, continuing with other students right now to improve the, the, the yield. Uh, again, for uh, using uh, those, uh, I mean, uh, porous materials, in this case, metal organic for uh, adsorption, uh, uh, I mean, properties uh, in terms of, you know, waste treatment, in this case, air pollution. So one of our PhD students work on the removal of VOC from indoor air. Uh, and in this case, uh, she used uh, non-thermal plasma as a main technique. Uh, which was, uh, I mean, joined with uh, a catalytic reactor. In this case, we use different MOFs, MIL-101, MIL-53, uh, and CPM-5 as a catalyst. As you can see here, uh, non-thermal non plasma itself, the green one shows uh, close to 40%, uh, I mean, uh, uh, conversion or removal of VOCs, while when we use those uh, different MOFs, we could uh, reach up to 90 3% of removal with MIL-53 uh, and MIL-101, uh, which was a huge uh, improvement in, uh, in terms of uh, efficiency of uh, this non-thermal plasma when we uh, couple it with uh, a catalytic reactor with MOFs. Uh, in the same line, we use MOF for CO2. One of our PhD students, Western University, uh, she worked on uh, removal of, uh, I mean, CO2 from flow gas using different MOFs. And uh, as you can see here uh, uh, in the publication that we published in 2013, uh, we uh, compared this MOF with a couple of uh, zeolites, and we noticed uh, MOF 5 uh, shows a huge, uh, uh, I mean, uh, improvement in terms of. Uh, CO2 adsorption. And based on this uh, project, recently I started a new pro five years uh, program working on using MOF as dual, uh, I mean, functional uh, uh, materials to absorb CO2 and convert it to value added products like, you know, polymers, like some other, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, chemicals. And uh, this is ongoing projects right now at UNBC. Uh, we use the uh, MOF uh, the same way as adsorbent. Uh, in this case, ZIF or zolytic Im imidazolate framework is a subcategory of MOFs. Uh, we uh, synthesize and modify in different fashion. And we notice with the specific heat treatment of uh, ZIF-8, we can increase the uh, adsorption of uh, VOC in this case, for example, toluene uh, to a huge extent by, by uh, modifying the particle size, which is related to surface area, and also uh, heat treatment to activate the moth in a specific, uh, I mean, uh, fashion. Uh, one thing that we are doing recently is one of the PhD students. Uh, so again, for uh, VOC measurement in air, in terms of uh, measurement, and also at the same time, in terms of uh, uh, treatment plan, uh, I mean, uh, process, one of the problems that we are having with VOC when we absorb it and we have to do the, I mean, uh, extraction using some solvents and those process adsorption, desorption, extraction, it's, it's going to uh, have, you know, a dilution factor that most of the case we are having problem with our detection limit with our gas chromatograph, uh, for example, in this case. So uh, SPM, your uh, solid phase micro extraction is the technique to go. There are a couple of uh, different commercial fibers of SPME. And uh, one of the problems for the commercial one is, the, is uh, I mean, uh, lower selectivity 
and uh, I mean sometimes they degrade so fast. So we decided to develop a MOF-based SPME fiber, and we used uh, uh, a substrate. In this case, a stainless steel H stainless steel substrate, and we grow uh, in situ some uh, a layer of MOF on this. Uh, I mean, uh, substrate and install it in the SPME syringe, and we to measure some VO, VOC, and the next step is some pH. And as you can see here. We, when we developed the 25 micrometer uh, MOF 199, uh, I mean fiber, we could uh, get uh, much better results, uh, almost up to 30 times more than uh, a commercial PDMS uh, DVB, I mean fiber, uh, which are very promising, uh, I mean results. And in this case, uh, it's improved the detection limit of our method, uh, eliminate some of those, um, I mean, uh, organic uh, solvent extraction, which is not eco-friendly as all of us know. So for that reason, uh, we are very excited about these ongoing projects to help us with uh, some of our, uh, I mean, air uh, pollution measurement and also control. Uh, and later we are thinking about using this uh, uh, fiber or this, this specific MOF uh, or other MOFs that we are uh, working on right now as a passive air sampler because they're very good uh, absorber with very high selectivity toward uh, different uh, VOCs, organic molecules. And we can tailor and engineer those uh, MOFs to be selective toward a specific group of, uh, I mean, organic molecules and then use it as an air sampler for uh, passive air sampling, you know, in workplaces. And that's a project that we are working and uh, with WorkSafe BC these days to develop new methods. At the same time, uh, as I said, the whole, I mean, cycle of lake eutrophication starts from nutrients, end up in the lake, and we have algal bloom. And the algal bloom, or what we call it, uh, I mean, uh, uh, green blue al uh, algae or cyan cyanobacteria. So when they die, they release lots of toxins, in this case, microcystins. And microcystin LR is one of the most toxic ones, as you can see in this, uh, uh, I mean, molecule. What we are doing right now, and actually it's one of the ongoing projects, um, we are trying to use MOF, in this case, MIL-101, which is uh, eco-friendly and uh, biodegradable, non-toxic, uh, high water stability and high surface area up to, you know, 1,400 uh, square meter per gram. And <clears throat> to remove uh, microcystin LR from contaminated water, because I said, <coughs> sorry, we, we try to really prevent the lake eutrophication process by addressing, you know, so, I mean, soil management and also addressing the uh, nutrients from the source in compost, in the fertilizer and the agriculture process. But at the same time, these things happen in these days and we need to address those things. We are trying to remove phosphate from water in order to prevent that one as well. But when in the cases that happens, because of the, you know, uh, we cannot address all of it, uh, and right now we are dealing with this problem almost every summer, uh, you know, specifically at the end of summer, you know, in fall season. And we are trying to really uh, come up with some sort of filtration system that people who are relying on those lake water, they might be, be able to use this filter, moth based filter to uh, purify their water and not being worried about microcystin LR, which is a toxin as, as we know. And we, we were uh, successfully, uh, you know, uh, removed up to 97%, as you can see, the ratio of one uh, gram of adsorbent to, to almost 2,000, uh, I mean, uh, milliliter or two liter of uh, water, we, we could remove uh, more than 97% of microcystin LR using this MOF. I'm going to take this opportunity to thank you, my, uh, my team. Uh, I started, as I said, uh, a long time ago by my team in uh, Tehran University in Iran. And then I moved to Canada. I worked uh, almost seven years at the University of Western Ontario. And then uh, my new team at UNBC since 2015. And of course, this uh, photo is pre-COVID. So we expanded right now. We have more than 15 um, uh, you know, graduate and uh, postdoc uh, the people working in the team on different uh, application of porous materials. And uh, 
the last but not least, I have to really uh, acknowledge uh, the support that we receive from different uh, funding agencies and different, um, I mean, uh, like uh, CFI, NSEC, MITAX, WorkSafe in Canada and different companies. And also some of our partners, UBC, uh, University, Technical University of Vienna, uh, Havana University and Al-Farabi University in Kazakhstan. And with that, I'm done. Thank you so very much for your attention.